coming up on this episode of Photography Online. I try my hand at street photography in Venice, Marcus gets his big one out for the first time, and we tell you our plans for the future of the show. Welcome to another episode of Photography Online and the last one for a while. More on that a bit later on, but don't panic, it's not all bad news. You might have noticed I am not in the Highlands of Scotland this time. We have popped down to Venice for a few days to do some photography and soak up the Italian lifestyle, which, as you can hopefully see, is going pretty well so far. I have got Simone showing me around the canals of the city, so I thought you might want to come along as well. Just don't expect me to share my pizza or gelato with you, though. That's asking a bit too much. All right, well, let's get this show on the road, or as is the case with this one, the alleyways of Venice. Street photography is a genre we haven't covered on the show before because it's not something that we can do very easily where we're based on sky, but it's something I've always been interested in and wanted to give a go. Armed with a suitable camera, something small and unobtrusive, and with the guidance of someone that knows far more than I do on the matter, I took to the streets to see what challenges I faced and what photos I could get. So James, I am very excited to be off Sky um, and in Venice. And uh, I've always quite liked the idea of street photography. Obviously where I live, there is nothing much in the way of streets. So we're here in Venice, I've got a chance to do it. You're here as well. And I think you've got some experience, some more experience than I do in the matter. Well, over the years, Marcus and I have shot a lot commercially in Italy um, and particularly here in Venice doing what would loosely be termed as street photography, certainly documenting mm life and documenting Venetian life and documenting the tourists as well and just people passing through this incredible city and it is the perfect place to get going for a multitude of reasons really but um, I suppose the two that stand out one it's beautiful and secondly people are used to having their pictures taken here and used to seeing people around with cameras yeah. so that's if you're going to start anywhere start in a place where people are comfortable seeing people with cameras. So Venice is quite unique obviously but what we're going to learn is hopefully going to translate over to most kind of street scenarios. Absolutely it will and because of the uniqueness of Venice it's it breeds creativity within us as well um, particularly that we're tourists here and that gives us the advantage of seeing things with fresh eyes. In terms of walking around people are obviously used to people with cameras. My main camera at home is, is, is the big Canon camera. To me it's just not something that I want to take out in the street. It feels a bit too in your face, it's too bulky. What's kind of the ideal well, setup? Well, simply, you would always start with simplicity with this form of photography. It's quite a complicated genre of photography, really. Although some of the settings might be quite straightforward, there's a lot of moving parts to it. You know, you're moving, the scenery might be moving, particularly here in Venice, and the people are moving. There's all sorts of things, and you want to get it right back down to pure observation and really concentrating on what your subject matter already is. So I, I like the idea of just taking a, a phone camera, but I want something a bit better. I want something kind of like my Canon, but small and unobtrusive. Well, I believe you might have something like that. I do have like something that, like, that, so, like that. So, so I, but you've got the ideal camera, yes. because which is your Leica. Yep. There it is and it has a fixed lens. I will say this is not my Leica. I have borrowed this Leica from Ford's. Big thank you to Ford's. Along Huge with a couple thank of, you to Ford's. And a, a nice convenient ba bag as well. Bag is small. equally as important. Yep. One of the things I talk about regularly is bags. The right bag for the right genre of yep. photography. And small and unobtrusive gives you the confidence to get out and about there. As I and said, if you had a big rucksack access. on, you're not going to be, yep. you know, you're going to be compromising what you do. So quick access although with that particular camera it's not overly important in fact you know the bag is great but you could just with that camera treat it as a phone camera a very expensive phone camera but it's it would be the same principle because it's a fixed 28 mil lens i believe it is so it's i mean it's good to go it's robust i'm good to go i think i've got everything i need camera it doesn't look like much I think I've got everything I need well, to Well, we've got so plenty of streets to explore, we've haven't we? Lots to do, so shall we go for a wander? Let's and you go can, get uh, lost. You can guide me as we go. We'll talk about settings a bit, a wee bit as well, but I think we're, yep. yeah, we'll start off, will you? Perfect, let's All get right, going. let's go. Mm. 
Venice, although only small by city standards, is a maze of photogenic alleyways, bridges and canals. With no roads, having to watch out for traffic is one less thing I need to worry about, which is great news as it means I have more brain power to devote towards being observational, something which I'm about to learn is everything when it comes to street photography. I also have to get to grips with operating a new camera, which, although not complicated in the slightest, does require some getting used to the position of all the key controls, as it's different to my own camera. So this is Venice, Ruth, as you well know, and your second time here. And this time, as you mentioned, you want to get into your street photography, but it's a broad canvas, it covers many areas of photography itself. And we have a fantastic canvas here in Venice. But what is it you really want to get out of it here? I just, I mean, I like the art of observation. We were, we were chatting about this earlier on. We and were. You know, the idea is to hopefully go around and see things, take pictures. But as we were discussing, a lot of this sometimes involves waiting. It does and involve observing. Work. Absolutely. The key, I mean, it the looks key spontaneous, is observation. But then it, observation yep. always comes into, key, into, the, into it as well. And we well. talked about simplicity a little bit as well. Mm. And although you've got a very advanced camera, it is actually a very simple camera to use mm. and it has the fixed lens. Yep. So managing expectations is going to be key to this. So I fixed think. is good because you don't have to faff around changing lenses. Don't have to you faff do around. Quickly. And it means that you are more likely to concentrate on your subject matter rather than choice of lens, choice of gear, and all of those thought processes. So Auto is out of the picture here as well. Are there any benefits to having aperture priority, for example, doing this kind of thing? It's a very common question. The answer is none, <laughs> absolutely, um, because there is no true auto setting where you, you know, that, that actually works where you're not dialing in some form of compensation over and above it anyway. So you might as well go straight to manual. So it is still key to know your camera Absolutely really well. Absolutely key. The three elements of shutter speed, aperture and ISO, working through those, making them work to your advantage, given the subject matter and your choice uh, of the story you want to tell. And the joy of this obviously is that those three things are easily accessible. So you can just- This camera is ideal for it. Yeah, yeah okay. absolutely. Yeah, All right. it certainly is. So we know where we are with the settings. We know we've got a fixed lens there. The next thing is to uh, start the whole process of photography. Number one, observation. Mm -hmm. So let's go see who we can find and in what environment they're in. All right, let's go. At first, walking around a new location felt a bit overwhelming and I didn't really know where to start. But it wasn't too long before I spotted a scene which, mostly due to the light, jumped out at me as being one where I should invest some time. Okay, so this is kind of very, it is very Venice, isn't it? It's quite compact. Very Venice, nice. absolutely. So we've got a couple of options. The way I would think about approaching this is to shoot it from square on or to shoot it from a 45 degree angle. And given the way the light is, the shape of the bridge and the colour tones and everything, I would suggest we do it from a 45 degree angle. So compositionally, there'd be two ways to kind of approach this. We know 45 degree angles in this kind of photography works really well, and we're kind of at that with the bridge here, certainly close enough anyway. So we either want to be in nice and close and use these beautiful railings to give us some foreground, or step much, much further back and show the entire bridge. Obviously with the camera you've got there, it's a there's no, we have to zoom with our feet, there's absolutely no other way of doing it because it's fixed and bolted hard. And there you go, there's a good fine example of the sort of thing we could do there. But because we weren't set up and because yeah. we hadn't looked down the alley at that point, we didn't know they were coming, so it kind of took us a little bit by surprise there. So if you were going to go close up and get a bit of foreground, you're, you're actually going right up yeah, to right the railings. Yeah, right up close, yeah. And then I'm choosing at this point, composition, for the scene, the general scene to set, and working out roughly where I would want somebody to do. Okay. Somebody to be, rather, as they walk through. So this is by far and away the harder side of things to do, because everything do, is magnified like this, greatly, but it's nice, right? Yeah. Very so, nice. So if we were to focus, uh, I mean, if you focus on the step, is that going to work? Well, you can get ready to press the button and we'll just shoot now, just, okay. and fire away now. There you go. Keep going, keep going, all the way. Very good, keep it running, keep it running, and there, and there. Very good. Excellent, look at that, that's super cool. That really is. One thing I learned very quickly is that you can't spend too long reviewing the images that you've just taken, otherwise you risk missing more opportunities. 
Just as I thought we were done with this location, I was suddenly being told to shoot. Go, 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 go. Just shoot, shoot straight away. Frame, shoot. Make sure she's focused. Yeah. That's absolutely spot on. Give her a bit of isolation there. Move to your left very quickly. Move to your left this way. Oh, me. Left, left, whole body <laughs> composition. Keep going, keep going. All right, get off, there get off, you go. get off, get off. There you go. <laughs> so what I was trying to do is get her in that because her hat was going against the window, but I um, wanted her hat against the terracotta wall. It's hard to spot that wall. when you're on the go. Uh -huh. I was just trying to keep the sign in like that. It's all about isolation, this sort of photography, especially with a single person like that. See how her head was just in front of the window there. That's nearly impossible to keep an eye on. Oh, look at that, it's right in the window. It's That's just right. practice, yeah. And actually the white hat there against that window frame may well work. Maybe because we're using an LCD on the back, I'd prefer to use the viewfinder. Okay. Even if it is an electronic one. Yeah, yeah. You're probably more likely to see that. That's true. You see things appear bigger through there, right? It looks minging through here. Looks what? It looks minging. <laughs> it looks minging. So it appears Marcus's dislike for electronic viewfinders is not exclusive to himself, as I seem to also have the bug. As we continued to explore the city, despite my newfound dislike for having to look at an artificial scene, James did go to great lengths to explain that for street photography, using the viewfinder rather than the rear screen does have lots of benefits, something we'll come back to later. We'll be returning to that feature later in the show to see how I got on. All right, well, if you are a fan of the show, make yourself comfortable because we're about to tell you some big news concerning photography online. We have been doing the show in its current format for three years now, and we feel it's time to move it on to the next level. We've got a huge list of ambitious ideas we want to develop, but these all take a huge amount of investment in both time and finance. So they've kind of just been sitting on a wish list and will remain there until we change things to allow us to have the opportunity to work on them. To save me having to explain the whys, the hows and the whens, I had a chat with the show's creator, Marcus. So Marcus, tell us why we've decided to make some changes to the show next year. What's, what's kind of brought this about? Well, we've been going for three years, as you just said, and um, we've got lots of ideas to take photography online forward. But the problem is, is that we can't do it whilst keeping to the current schedule. So we need to basically take a step back in order to take two steps forward. Um, so there's, for example, there's lots of ideas that I've got on this piece of paper here, which is a complete year's worth of schedule. Um, and some of these ideas require three or four of us mm -hmm. to be away for 10 days at a time filming. Now, in the current schedule, where we're doing a show every two weeks, we just can't do that. And so these have always been ideas that are never going to get off this paper unless we change things up a bit. So we just need to throttle back in order to be able to put our foot back on the accelerator again when we're ready to go. So 2024 we're coming back with our regular schedule but in terms of 2023 how's that looking for the Photography Online channel? Yeah so we won't be just disappearing off the face of the earth, um, we'll still be releasing uh, occasional content and that will either be pre-recorded stuff, um, basically bringing people up to date with what we've been up to, what we're working on for the following year, um, interspersed with maybe some live content as well. So we can do uh, one hour live shows where we do a Q&A um, and uh, yeah, we throw a, a little bit of extra content in there as well. But doing a live show means that it's only an hour of our time. Obviously, we've got the preparation to do, but that's, that's insignificant compared to the amount of time it takes to do an hour of recorded show. Um, so that just frees us up still gives the viewers a little bit of content, but um, hopefully they'll be understanding that we're doing this in order to take things forward, There's not to yeah. take things backwards. Yeah. So 2023, putting things out as and when we can. Uh, coming back to 2024, back to a regular show. We're not losing the kind of regular format we've got just no. now. So we'll be back to uh, a monthly show. It'll be around an hour long. Um, and by the time we start, I want to ideally be six months ahead so that the production value is way, way higher. We're not into that situation where we realise that we've got to get a show out and we've only got four days to do it because then you start cutting corners and saying, 
that'll do just get it out which i don't want to do um so um we'll be back to a regular show but we'll intersperse the regular show with our live show as well um so hopefully there'll be content every two or three weeks, um, as has been the case up till now. So with the live show, I know we've got some plans to make it open to more people than we do at the moment. Uh, absolutely, so we're making it more accessible, so the whole supporter system will be um, simplified okay. um, and uh, it will be more accessible to everybody. We'll have bigger prizes, uh, hopefully bigger sponsors, because I'll have a time to work on all that. At the moment, I don't have time to talk to anybody. I don't even have time to make a phone call. So um, ha having a little bit more time will hopefully bring in more investment into the show, which will allow us to do more traveling all around the world, uh, make it a more global affair rather than here we are again on the Isle of Skye because we haven't got time to go Which anywhere. is what we planned originally. Obviously, we started January 2020. Everyone knows what happened. A couple of months later, we were kind of, we were locked down into Sky. Um, but yeah, the original plan was to travel more, so looking forward to being able to do some more of that. So it's not bad news. I know, it's, 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 it's very positive news, yeah. but it's just uh, on the understanding that we need to just take a breather before we can rush on ahead with this plan here, because this plan here needs time. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, I don't have time, so we need to create the time for this to happen. Yeah. Um, so obviously 2024, we're coming back with a regular show, but you've got a bit of a break next year to go out and do stuff for yourself, maybe get your mojo back. Is that something you're looking forward to doing? Is that going to tie into maybe you know, your enthusiasm with uh, bringing that show yeah. up to the next level? Well, firstly, my mojo has never gone anywhere, <laughs> um, but purely selfishly, purely selfishly, um, things like I bought a new camera six months ago. It's the first new camera I bought for a long time. And I've managed to get out and use it twice so far, just because there's not enough hours in the day and days in the week. So it'd be quite nice to just have a little bit more time to do the things that I want to do. And then that freshens me up to put more effort into, into this. So um, I think going on the original schedule, um, I would lose my interest and enthusiasm very quickly. Which does come across, so yeah. Yeah, so doing this is, is better for, for everybody and um, we'll just be looking to bring the show back bigger and better than it's ever been before with bigger prizes, bigger sponsors um, and just taking it to that next level which is where I've always wanted to go but I just can't do it in the current s schedule. Okay, so if you're one of our current supporters, we're going to be removing all the tiers from the end of this year and starting again in 2024. Please do come back to us as your support means so much and it's key to making our plans happen. Remember, just because you're not seeing that much from us in 2023, we will still be working harder than ever on the show. Now, we don't expect your support during this time, but if you would like to help fund the big changes ahead, please do feel free to contact us directly and we'll let you know how you can do this. If you're one of our current supporters, then we'll be listing you all at the end of the show when we'll be running the best of our bloopers since the start of photography online so keep an eye out for that. We'll also be posting regular updates on our social media pages and all the things that we're working on as well as showing what's going on behind the scenes so if you're not already following us there it's a great way to keep up to date with our progress as we aim for bigger and better. Okay, well, you just heard Marcus saying he would like some more time to get out with his new camera. Well, the first ever time he took it out, he filmed the process. You could say an historic moment, so that we could all tag along. Well, good morning from Loch Farda, here on the Isle of Skye. As you can tell, there's midges around. This isn't just a fashion statement. So I've been waiting here for probably an hour and a half. Um, and I've turned up this morning because as you can see, we've got this perfect reflection on the lock. Um, zero wind. Um, and when that happens on the forecast, then this is one of the places that I tend to turn up. But zero wind also means lots of midges, especially in the summer. Um, the cloud is kind of spoiling the show at the moment. Um, it is clearing. There are bright patches appearing on the eastern horizon, which is giving me optimism that I should stick around for another half an hour or so. Um, what I ideally want is just little bits of dappled light and hitting the main parts of the scene. Uh, let's talk about the camera. Uh, because of the camera's a lot further away from where you are than where I am, it looks quite small. But let me go down here to give you a sense of perspective. This is an 8x20 camera 
and it's the first time I've used it. So a bit of a momentous moment this. Now, I'm loaded with Ilford FP4 film. Uh, you're very limited with the amount of film that you can get or the choice of film that you can get for this camera. So uh, basically looking at black and white and there's only about four different uh, emulsions that you can get. So I've got FP4 loaded. I'm using a 450 millimeter lens, which the 35 millimeter equivalent or full frame equivalent would be about 35 millimeter. Uh, so 450 sounds like a long focal length, but on this camera, certainly width wise, it's actually quite a wide angle lens. Height wise is about 70 millimeters. So uh, we're just waiting for the light really. Hopefully something will happen. Um, but even if it doesn't, then I'm probably gonna take a shot anyway, just because it's the first time I've ever used this camera and I don't want to not take a shot here and then go somewhere else on another day and for the light to be absolutely epic. And I discover that there's a teething problem or I'm doing something wrong. I don't think there's anything gonna be wrong with the camera because there's very little that can go wrong with this thing. There's no batteries, nothing like that. It's very simple. Um, but it would be good to just take a shot here anyway, even though I might know that it's not gonna be a keeper. Um, develop the film, which I'll do myself at home, just so that I've gone through the motions so that when I do take an epic shot, um, I'm not learning any lessons or making any mistakes. So that's the plan, but hopefully we can tick two of those boxes together. We can get a shot and in decent light. So it's a kind of test, but it could also be a keeper. You know. So sticking it out and seeing what happens. So I think the time has come where I'm going to have to take a photo because the light's not going to happen. Um, but the reflection's starting to disappear because the, the breeze is just picking up a little bit, which is good for the midges. Um, not good for the photo though. So I think we should just get on with this. Um, it's going to be an eighth of a second F32. So, shutter's cocked. Hopefully there's no midges in the camera. There probably are. So, let's pull this dark side out. I don't know whether that's gonna stay there or not. It's quite a big dark slide. Okay, here goes. So here is that negative, which I developed myself because I don't think there's a ProLab out there that would offer this as a service. For anyone interested, I simply tray developed the film for the recommended time of eight minutes. I've since heard that due to the oxidization of the chemicals when tray developing, you should add an extra 10% of the time. So I'll try that in the future, as this negative could certainly do with a bit more contrast, but it's certainly okay for a first attempt. As I mentioned, I had no expectations that this photo was ever going to be anything other than a test shot. The scene simply wasn't working well enough. But this does give an idea of the detail which I'll be able to get out of this beast in the future. Zooming in reveals just how much information is packed into this image. Not surprising when you consider that it's over a hundred times the size of a full frame sensor. I also love the ratio this camera gives, which is 2.5 to one. My other panoramic options give a 3 to 1 ratio, which I often find just a little too wide, so this seems perfect. All in all, this is a good start and makes me look forward to using it in more exciting conditions next time. So that's it. That's a sheet of 8x20 film exposed, which costs about £15 a shot. So, pack up and go home. Thanks for joining me. Hopefully next time, taking a slightly more impressive photo. Pretty much everything you see here is custom made, even the tripod. The camera is made to order 
as are the film holders. The film itself is custom made by Ilford once per year, which means it has to be ordered by July, and if I'm lucky, I get it by October. A camera of this size obviously needs some serious support, so the tripod I'm using here is custom made by King Joy. I do have a spare if anyone's interested. Basically, if you want to get into ultra-large format photography, then don't expect to walk into a retailer and buy everything off the shelf. Amazingly though, it's cheaper than a top-end digital setup and it will deliver far superior results. Just be prepared for everything to take a very long time. But who's in a hurry? I have to say, I was with Marcus when he shot those subsequent shots on the camera and it really is remarkable to see it close up and to look at the image on the ground glass on the back. I'm sure you'll be seeing more of that in the future shows. Okay, well at the start of the show I was getting a crash course in street photography from team member James. Let's pick up where we left off to see how everything turned out. Okay, now James, this is Venice street photography. I mean, this is to you Venice street photography. This is, I mean, we've got the canal. This no, is the street. You're right. One of the best things that we have going for us here is it's backlit for a start. Okay. So, um, gives us a lot of control of the light as well, being under cover here. But what are you going to take a picture of in here? Well, what I mean, catches your eye? The light catches my eye initially. Yeah. Then we've got this. We've got the steps. We've got the canal. I got, a, I got a bit of love for the pigeons going on as well, but I'm imagining we might get some boats going past, do you think? We will. Um, so we have light at the back of the scene. Yeah. We need the human element, so a gondola may pass this way, of course it may pass that way. Somebody holding an umbrella. Yeah, yeah. Could potentially come down the mm -hmm. stairs as somebody is there, perfectly coming down the stairs. I've got some uh, nice really pigeons and stuff, up. which yep. is, uh, might work. So, so somebody and... holding an umbrella and we'd come down the stairs. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Yes, perfect. <laughs> Shall we go try and set up a composition? Yeah, so we should work from this side to this side and see in terms of composition, yeah. Okay. And there is a gondola going past right now. There you go. So what we so can do is work out the height, actually, yep. and indeed someone coming over the bridge right okay. now as well. So yep. we can work things out. Now, do you think we see enough gondola there? Possibly, but we may well see a little bit more if we could By moving this further over, yeah. Yeah, coming mm -hmm. around just to get a bit square on and get yep. that clean view past the two pillars. That I do here. quite like just seeing the tail fin there. Which yeah, it does about, work. We get the classic it composition does. nailed first and then we can Yeah, absolutely. Play. So I would suggest we take one from here, mm -hmm. one from the uh, okay. centre, and one from the other side. Okay, another one. All right, uh, so and another done. one. Yeah. See if you can. I'll get the tail. Hang on. Where's yeah. So tail? purely, you're exposing for the light that's falling on the gondola, with a tiny bit of leeway to hold the shadows where we are. So that's probably a stop or two darker than that. So shall we try and go for the square on? Yeah. Let's have a look at a composition from looking down these two columns here. So that gives us more We're of a probably chance. Probably from here somewhere. Maybe if you just step back, you can bring that second column into play. And what we're also looking for here is the separation with the door on this side of this column here, look. And down. Yeah, and then a tiny bit. It's all small details, these, but a tiny bit to your left to narrow that gap down in there. And you'll get the separation with the second column there, look. Do you want, you mean this way? There you go, yep, yeah, that's it. Okay. Exactly there, does that make sense? Yes, it does. So we're on, I mean, settings-wise, F4, 500th of a second, uh, which seems to be yeah, working really F4, well. Yeah, F4, we don't need to worry about depth of field too much because you're never going to bring this column in anyway. We just need to make sure, as I said earlier, we're exposing for the highlights because that's where the action's going to yeah, be. Yeah, that's what we've but done. But holding, if at all possible, enough detail in the shadow. Okay. And in fact, right now, we're going to get the perfect silhouette so we can just keep shooting that all the way because we know they're right there. Keep going, keep going. Perfect, perfect, perfect. 
and we might just have a chicken dinner there, not to scare <laughs> the pigeons. There we go, one of those, yeah, with the arm mounts, particularly nice there. Knowing spots like this in Venice is always useful, as I could have stayed here for hours, capturing gondolas and people passing by the classic and intimate Venetian scene. Keep going. Keep shooting. There we go. Very good. Okay, Ruth, let's have a look. Let's go through those. Which one do you think you prefer? Is it choice there. I'm waiting for the pro. There it is. Yeah. Should we check it sharp? Okay. And it is absolutely pin sharp and perfectly exposed and I think if you go back to the full frame there, yep, look at all the shadow detail there. Spot on. Perfectly done. Excellent. Excellent. Another spot. Right. So James, We've kind of lost the light a little bit now, but we are in a city. Is there still potential for doing some street stuff? Yeah, we absolutely have. In fact, we've more than lost the light. It's kind of gone yeah. for the sort of photography we've been doing today, which has been pretty much people-based, right? So we have to look for an alternative light source. And as with all the people things that we shot today, it was pretty much what caught your attention. So now we just turn that to rather than people, to the lights. Okay. And we'll go and find some things like that. As far as nighttime city lights go, few places do it as well as Venice, so it wasn't difficult to find a suitable scene to work with. So we'll work down that side down there, or we'll work down that side down there. Okay. Talking about the lots of top lighting coming down on people, yeah. and then the bounce up from the floor to fill them in, and maybe shoot from a nice low angle, F2. Okay. Give yourself F2 because it's going to be workable there. Do you want a very shallow depth of field? Yeah. F2, and then base everything on F2, and enough shutter speed to freeze the action. People are walking, so we'll go to 250th. It's probably a bit too much, but it'll do, and then raise the ISO. It looks a lot brighter yeah, on the camera do. than it does up here. Is that, well, is that what I'm doing? Yes, it is what you're doing. And remember that the feel of depth of field will get greater if our principal subject matter is much closer to the camera. Yeah. So we're going to move forward. So, I was just about to say that, yeah. to go to a portrait yeah. orientation. Personally, I'd experiment with going off to one side as well. Okay. So it's, everything's not perfectly symmetrical, and I'd be using the lights that are coming off a shot window to pick someone's features out if I wanted to. Now it's all about observation of people. And photograph that right now. Keep going, keep going. There you go, it's working perfectly, in fact. Very good. Now just concentrate on keeping your horizon straight there. There we go, and you've got separation between them there now. And then just get down a little lower, so drop right down and you'll get all that Christmas lights in at the top. There we are, really nice. Absolutely spot on. Pleased with that one. Yeah, really nice. So basically all that's happening in this particular scenario is that you are matching the light that's coming off the windows. It's about one stop, one and a half stops less falling on our principal subject matters than it is the fairy lights. Good day, Ruth. Pretty good day. Yeah. Yeah. Challenging. Challenging, yes, I would use that word. Well, we've got everything on the machine here, on the computer. So should we have a look through yeah. some of the highlights? Yes. So first shot here, lady crossing the bridge. So obviously we've got the composition sorted out. Mm -hmm. And in essence, this shot's all about separation, timing and separation. So we need the, light, the lady to be uh, separated against the background. So the first shot didn't quite work because we didn't have that separation, the way she's walking. Absolutely. And then we move on to the second one there and it is absolutely spot on. And what you've also done there, which is really nice, is clip that four rail as well. Mm -hmm. So the left hand railing, or right hand as we're looking at it, railing there. So, but there is still quite a lot of sort of um, empty steps. One thing that would improve this shot is if it had been raining, for example, okay. and the steps had been wet, yeah. it would have been lovely. So let's have a look at the next shot as well, which is uh, a great piece of sort of observation and uh, picking out an individual mm -hmm. chap. So although he's not perfectly isolated, the lighting is actually uh, helping us with the isolation there. But this tree at that angle and the olive trees tailoring away, he's got a good journey to come on, he's clearly travelling from left to right. So it's a pretty good shot that really, it's pretty hard to beat and it is full of character. Mm. And, to, and the colours complement the scene as well, mm. generally. So. Well, speaking of observation, uh, the next shot that we kind of came across 
an interesting bunch of people in this. And yeah. I shot this before um, I zoomed in on the camera at the back. Would you like? Would you like to zoom in on this? And uh, yeah, let's have a little zoom in on this and, and have a look at what's going on. Yeah, what does that say? Yeah, well, it's a, it's definitely an icon saying no photography. Absolutely, and I will admit I might have noticed that before persuading <laughs> you to take that picture. Thanks. But it's a nice scene. And some of the positives are here, there's lots of positives, but it's a nice 45 degree angle running through. The light's a little on the flat side, but there is still some shaping to it. But each individual character within yeah. this scene is nicely isolated and separated. Nobody's crashing into anyone else, all the expressions are pretty strong. And of course, the chap saying no photography. Um, and it's and it's not a coincidence that that separation's there, that's a natural eye thing more than anything. And speaking of natural eyes, the next thumbnail I can see here is a picture I would never take. I like this one. But you do. And it's very Ruth and it is a huge piece of sort of, you know, of observation, natural mm -hmm. eye composition. It's amazing, really. So the next couple of shots is something I found really quite challenging. I spotted this guy, obviously, I liked the look of him, but this is as, as close as I wanted to go, shall we say. Yeah. Um, and, you Which know, is fairly close on a 28 mil lens. I have to say, to I said, yeah, the 28 was, was an interesting one to work with, but you know, it, it kind of works, but you obviously saw the potential in this shot too. Took the camera, got down and did something <laughs> a little bit. Well, I, don't, I wouldn't say I did anything better, I just did something different. different yes. So this is a very, very classic repertoire shot and the angle of it very much suits the, um, the style of the content of the subject matter, so it's really, really good. But there are other ways to do it. So you've taken a classic piece of reportage, and if we have a look at the one I took here, this is a classic piece of commercial nonsense, shall we say. So it could go well with the coffee chains that I've taken pictures for over the years, all of that kind of thing, um, very commercial. So, but you, this, in, this requires engagement with your subject yeah. matter. So night fell, obviously, in the city, uh, but we carried on and we went looking for some, you know, obviously non-natural light, got some quite nice results. Yeah, some very nice results. So again, you know, you've got a scenario here where you've found the environment we want to shoot in. Mm -hmm. So the light's coming, it's coming from the, sh people might not be able to see, it's coming from the shop windows Absolutely. outside and it's coming down Absolutely uh, from the right. fairy lights as well. But when you first look at this shot, which is one of the first ones that um, you did here, it's okay and of course it's a fantastic floor, but really it's about the Christmas lights in the background, isn't it? The, this particular composition anyway. So just by getting down low, you've still got the floor, yeah. but you're minimising it a little bit, but you're definitely bringing in the... Uh, the Christmas lights in the background. We've also uh, we deliberately lost that sliver of light from the shop window, which is kind of distracting. It was a little distracting, yeah. And then we focused in on what's really important, which is the people, mm -hmm. the Christmas lights, and the overall ambience of, mm -hmm. of the square at night. So we photographed people, I wouldn't say from afar, because you had your 28mm lens mm -hmm. here, but you've certainly had people from middling distance middling. that were unknown to both photographer and person. And you also took pictures of people, you know, like the chap at the, the coffee shop and the chap on the, gon the gondola, as the much closer. As the day progressed, I, I got maybe a foot or two feet closer. But yeah, that was the big challenge for me because we're shooting with a pretty wide lens here. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't have much problem spotting things I want to shoot, but I don't like getting in people's face. So that's something I guess I will work on or buy a longer lens. It should be nice as well. But um, yeah, that was definitely the hardest part for me. But as I say, you get used to it as the day and goes on. would you on. do it again? I would do it again, yeah. I'd go out again with a small camera if I can and just, you know, observe and like yeah, say... it's a lot of fun. Finding locations, letting people come to you or, you know, uh, also, you know, knowing your settings really well, being ready yeah. to go, which was one being of the big prepared. things you said. Absolutely. Um, so all those tips were fantastic. So yeah, that was Venice, but uh, yeah. Well, ne next city, city. Next, next city. city. I spent another two days walking around the city putting my newfound street photography skills to the test. Here are a few of my favourite shots from my trip.
tell you what, I thoroughly enjoyed that and I'll definitely be doing more of it in the future. And as always, a big thank you to Ford's Photographic for lending me all the gear that I needed. Sadly, I do need to give it all back, but with Christmas coming up, you never know. Two on subtle. Well, girl can only try. As we explained earlier on in the show, this will be the last photography online in its current format. While we take a break to work on the new show, which will be bigger and better than ever. In the meantime, we will be releasing the occasional piece of content, so keep an eye out for any new videos. In fact, on Sunday, the 18th of February at 6 p.m., we'll be doing a live Q&A right here. So if you have a question that you want answered or an image you'd like help with, then do send them into the usual address for which there's a link down below. Once again, thank you to everyone who supported us over the past three years. We wouldn't have been able to do it without your generosity and we'll be relying on it more than ever when we return in 2024, so please do come back. Starting right now on screen is a list of all our current supporters, so this show has been sponsored by you. We will be back, but until then, you know the score. Take good care, but most of all, take good photos. It doesn't matter which camera you use, at least you can always give you <laughs> Now, 50mm is known as a standard focal length because it Just don't expect me to share my pixie or gelato with you. That's asking a bit too much. Pixie? That's what it says. Pizza. Oh, dude, change it. Onto the sensor, apart from clean air. On the subject of blowing, we want. <laughs> <laughs> Why did I say that? <laughs> okay, take two. All right, well, it's time for the section you've all been waiting for. We're welcoming onto the stage our star student. And in this month's episode of Schools Out, we're explaining the aperture scale, something which... F f f no. I personally have a bloody hell of 500 pounds today. This is quite easy. Just double 22 and we get 44. Double it again, we get 88. Double it again, we get 176. As you can see, stories don't need to be drawn out. They can last from a few seconds to feature length. Feature length. <laughs> Why can't I say that? Feature length. Film. Feature length film. As you can see, stories don't need to be drawn out. They can last from a few seconds to feature length. <laughs> okay, well, you just heard Marcus saying he would like to get out more with his camera and use it some more for Pete's sake. Each clip. 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 Each clip. 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 <laughs> what? Oh, well, you got as far as the second <laughs> one. I can't do it without saying clip now. <laughs> which has got a couple of unique features, so the producers have given him four minutes to tell us all about it. That's three. Oh. oh my goodness. And then, if you decide that you want to have a soft grad, just turn that bad boy upside down. <laughs> Don't you start laughing at me. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> there must be some lip warm-up exercises though. Ah, oh, there you go. It's a great way to keep up to date. <laughs> oh crap. <laughs> Perfect, let's get going. Oops. Okay, Mouse, tell us when any birds are coming, okay? That's your job. That's what you're hired for. That's how you get the money. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, that's, that's how you get the money, Miles. <laughs>